freeze. Uh, a freeze frame is generated on an OBD2 uh, open board diagnostics 2 vehicle. Uh, when, is, when does it happen? What's the difference between an A or a B? A is a catalyst, uh, possibly catalyst. Cali catalyst damaging misfire. B is, you know, a B is actually a misfire that's, uh, if you're talking about a misfire, but there's other diagnostic trouble codes that are A and B too, but misfires are the ones that we most frequently talk about in regard to A or B. Um, it's measuring, uh, it's always watching for, for example, it's always watching for misfires, and if it finds so many misfires within a 200 RPM range, which is really frequent, um, then it's uh, going to throw a code that's a B misfire, I mean an A, and then if it finds so many within a 1000 RPM window, that's a, call, that's a B misfire. Um, okay, so an ignition misfire or a fuel mis a mixture problem is what kind of DTC? What kind of dynamic trouble goes? That is a type A. All right, now, well, the reason what we went, and I'll back up a little bit on this, whenever we first started having computers on cars, to start with, they just built the computers and stuffed them on the cars to do the job, whatever, you know. Chrysler came out with uh, a lean burn system, they called it, back in uh, the 70s, and they had this computer hanging on the side of the breather that, you know, would do things related to, I guess, ignition timing and fuel mixture and all that. I mean, I tinkered with some of those cars, but I didn't have any schooling on them. Uh, but basically, then General Motors went pretty heavy into the computer stuff in uh, 1980. And uh, as soon as General Motors went into it pretty strong, they had to work with flash trouble codes. That was onboard diagnostics one uh, in the real early years. And they basically wanted the computer to be able to tell when there was a problem and flag, send some kind of a flag, a check engine light or whatever. And then uh, whenever the engine, I mean, whenever the mechanic went in there, he could actually jumper a couple of wires on this data link and make it flash out a code, and that was the computer telling you what's wrong in as much as it can tell. And it ain't going to give you, tell you which bolt to tighten or nothing like that or where your vacuum leak is. It's just going to tell you I'm running rich, I'm running lean, you know, I've got an open circuit here, I've got an open circuit there, and that kind of thing. Now, when you're looking at diagnostic trouble codes, there's diagnostic trouble codes that are present right now, and then there's diagnostic trouble codes that were present but are not anymore. Uh, and you're in the Ford arena, whenever you, like on the Bronco, if you pull your diagnostic couple codes, the first codes you're going to get, it's going to give you each one of them twice. Uh, and that's going to be what's wrong right now. Like if you key on engine off test, turn on the key and let it start flashing that light at you. As you write down those, you know, if it's like, you know, to start it, they started out with two digit codes, then they came out with three digit codes, and then they started, you know, whenever OBD2 came along, they started out with a P for powertrain, B for body, C for chassis, and U for network, and this kind of thing. Uh, in other words, be a P0305 would be a misfire on cylinder number five, which is what y'all pick up the other day. Anyway, backing up, not only did they want the computer, they, they, computers, they said, well, if, if we can make it do this, and we can write algorithms that will make it actually make arrangements in changing its air fuel mixture in order to overcome a lean condition if it's not that bad. If it springs a vacuum leak, you know, that's going to impact the emissions of the tailpipe. So we want the uh, fee fuel feedback system to be able to look at this oxygen sensor and add a little more fuel to overcome this imbalance that's put there by the uh, vacuum leak or whatever, or by a barometric pressure sensor that's reading high altitude when you're at low altitude, and that'll rob your fuel. Anyway, understand what OBD is. Onboard diagnostic means the computer can tell what's wrong, and it can flag you and tell you which general direction to look. You know, and there's almost no machine I've ever heard anywhere that's going to tell you where to look for your problem other than pointing you in a general direction. Just because you've got an oxygen sensor code or what you perceive to be doesn't mean they're screwing an oxygen sensor and they're going to fix it. There's a lot of people that fall in that trap. Um, and there's a lot of people that want to just plug in a scan tool, change a part, and be done, and whoopee, and do those kind of jobs all day every day. Yeah, that sounds good, but that ain't the way it works. You know, when you get out there working, there's, there's a lot of, like for instance, if, if you've got some kind of an evaporative emissions problem, you got to pump smoke in there and hunt for that, you may have to pull a gas tank, there's all kinds of stuff you need to do for that. Um, the comprehensive component monitor checks components for what? A, functionality, B, opens, C, rationality, or D, all of the above. Now, what is rationality? Anybody know what rationality is? What's a rationality check? How can a computer do that? Well, sort of. A rationality, well, yeah, they're just using the word. But, 
compare it to what they know to be right? Actually, what it does is, like for instance, and this is just one example of a rationality check. If I'm the computer and I'm going to dump some upstream air in there from my air injection reactor, you know, which is there for helping the catalyst take care of hydrocarbons on it, I'm going to dump some air upstream. What should I see as a result of that? I should see the oxygen sensor reflect that I've dumped some air upstream, you know, because it's, it's smelling oxygen. Oxygen sensor ain't smelling fuel. So I'm going to dump some air upstream, and then I'm going to see my oxygen sensor. If I put air upstream and my oxygen sensor doesn't tell me it has happened, then I'm going to say I've either got an inoperative air system or there's something else wrong, you know, something with the oxygen sensor or whatever. There's another thing. Let's look at this. You've got mass airflow. It's reading the air coming in, right? Mass airflow goes up, starts out, you know, it's reading grams per second the way the thing's interpolated now. But basically, if you're looking at the voltage, that mass airflow sensor, you're going to see usually, you know, some of them read hertz and all this, but on the light ranger out there, it's going to read about eight-tenths of a volt. Okay, now, if I'm uh, in, applying some current to my idle air control, and I'm going to open up that passage that goes around the throttle plate, without you moving the throttle plate, I'm going to open up passage, I'm going to let some more air go by there so I can pick up the idle speed. What should I see at the mass airflow? I should see an increase in airflow at the mass airflow, right? That's a rationality check. I'm giving it more idle air. I should see the mass airflow reflect that. If I'm giving it idle air and I don't see that, I know there's a problem in one place or the other. Got me? What about this? I've got, if I've got a throttle position sensor and a mass airflow sensor, and I'm reading both of them, and the, and the computer is, the mass airflow sensor and the throttle position sensor should pretty well read like this, shouldn't it? Like if I'm giving it the gas, I should ought to see more here. But what if? My trace doesn't look like that. What if my, my mass airflow trace is flat and I give it some gas and the mass airflow doesn't follow it? That's a rationality check. They should go together. You can do a rationality check yourself. You know, I can actually cause things to happen that should cause certain results. It's a cause effect, effect balance. You say you got to have a feedback circuit. So it's got to say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to look over here to see if it happens. It does it with transmissions. You'll pull a code every now and then and say, incorrect gear ratio obtained for fourth gear. It's looking at engine speed, it's looking at road speed, it knows what gear it's in, it knows how fast the drive shaft ought to be turning on that engine speed and that gear. If it doesn't see what it likes, then it's going to flag you a code that says incorrect gear ratio obtained for third gear. Or that kind of thing. See where we're going with that? All right, now that's a, that's a rationality check. Functionality is, is it working at all? B is open. All right, if I unplug my TP sensor, what am I going to see on my signal wire in the engine controller? Flat line zero, right? If I unplug my uh, intake air temperature sensor, what am I going to see? It's a two wire sensor. I'm going to see 4.6, which is equivalent to 40 below zero. Mm -hmm. Got me? Your OBD2 room in your engine controller, you know, you can go into enhanced or OBD2. Your OBD2 room is all go always going to read 40 below when you unplug a temperature sensor. Your enhanced room frequently will substitute a value that it feels like will work. It may substitute 101 degrees. So if you look in your enhanced room and you see 101 degrees, now you may look into your OBD2 room and see 40 below. You know, which one's telling you the truth? You know, the enhanced room will lie to you because it basically is wanting the car to run as good as it can in spite of the fault. Now, it's going to turn on a light and all that. But anyway, you'll, you'll, you'll run into that if you get into this. Uh, and the smartest thing you can do, and I've said this before, I told uh, Brown this the other day, uh, every time you get a chance, you need to plug a scan tool in, look through those readings, and see what's normal. Because the more you look at what's normal, the more you'll be able to recognize what's not. That clear? You understand that? That's why the treasury guys look at real money. They don't look at fake money. Whenever they see fake money, they can tell you right on it. My wife works at a bank teller, and she can pick up a bill right quick and tell you it's, it's a counterfeit bill. And she sees them fairly regularly over there, too. Um, people printing them on inkjet printers and stuff. You know. All right. Now, then, we got, um, let's see, uh, OBD2 onboard diagnostic 2 has been on all passenger cars uh, in the United States since... 96 was actually, yeah, sort of, but there were some. 94, that they started. 94 they started. Uh, Camaros in 95 had the 16-pin OBD2 style connector under the dash, but they were still OBD1. Duh, what's, what's up with this? You know, they just changed the shape of the connector and left it OBD1? Whose idea was that? You know, I mean, so if you plug into a 95 Camaro expecting to get OBD2, you may be dreadfully surprised. Of course, General Motors always had a good data stream. You know, and so is Chrysler. They've always pretty much had a good data stream, too. But uh, I will tell you this, and, and this passenger cars it makes this a good statement because I have seen uh, one-ton pickup trucks that were 97 models that were still OBD-1. You got me? 
I mean, there was a waiver on some of these vehicles, but by 1998, it was a drop dead deadline. Everybody had to be OBD2 and onboard diagnostic. Now, what, what's OBD3? You ever heard of OBD3? What happens there? I don't know what happens. I mean, what's that's different? That's DLC3. And yeah. and well, OBD3 is uh, they're talking about all kinds of ways of doing this. And. Uh, you guys, you guys read that Digital Superman book I wrote? Remember the guy's driving his Lincoln and it starts running bad, and all of a sudden he gets a flag on his on his instrument cluster that says uh, that Ford Star Satellite has picked up a misfire on this Lincoln, and then it pops his GPS up and says, "You need to tell us which dealer you're going to go to to get this fixed, and how soon you're going to be there." Really? You know? Yeah. And then whenever he punches that, well, I'll go to this dealer. The woman in the write-up area pops up on her little notebook clipboard. She's talking to this guy. I mean, this car is coming in and it's registered to this woman, and it's got a you know misfire on cylinder number seven and this kind of thing. And so she already knows he's coming. It even gives her a GPS, tell her where the guy is and when he's going to be there, so she can get him out and get him on back on the road. See that thing? So she starts writing the work order right then. I mean, that's one of the scenarios for OBD3. Another one is putting a little booth beside the road, like a phone booth or something that actually reads a, a transponder on your car on the way by, and that transponder has stored your most recent freeze frame data and t trouble codes and all this kind of stuff. So when it goes by, they know if you're keeping your car working right. What? You got a PO420? What have you done? Took the catalytic converter off your redneck pickup truck? Excuse me? You know? <laughs> you know, it's this kind of thing. <laughs> you know, how do you see guys buy a brand spanking new pickup truck? I've seen them do this. The yo yos. They buy a brand spanking new pickup. The first thing they do is chop the doggone catalytic converters off of it and put loud pipes on it. You know? If I give me a new truck, I'm going to leave it alone. You know what I'm saying? I ain't going to chop mine up like that. I mean, you put some fancy wheels on it or something, but leave the doggone this stuff alone. Anyway, uh, I kind of got off on a tangent there. Um, but anyway, fuel trim and misfires are continuously monitored. You anyway, look at those all the time. However, when is the time? Uh, that's that's sort of true, but it's not really. And I'll tell you why. When are we not looking at fuel trim and when are we not looking at misfires? There's one time when every car ignores fuel trim and misfires for about two minutes. At least. When you first fire it up. Because you're going to have random misfires when you first start it up and your fuel trims are going to be totally unreliable. And so this is really not a good question. You know what I mean? I mean we actually had, uh, when, they, when these things first came out, uh, when I was working with Ford, we had a bunch of them that were throwing these misfire codes all over the place. And the misfire code was being set within the first 240 seconds of the engine start. Well, if you let it get past that, they wouldn't be doing that. You got me? All right, so what you do? Yeah, that's what the answer key says. If you don't get it right, put true. But I would, uh, when we would... Uh, what we do is we plug into it and we'd, we'd reflash it, and uh, it would reflash it so that it would ignore the misfires for the first 240 seconds, so that it wouldn't throw a bunch of stupid codes and all that kind of stuff. Now I used to get really irritated with some of these things that are too smart for their own good. I had this worldwide diagnostic system thing that we plug in a little laptop thing sitting on top. Of it. it came after the service based diagnostic system, diagnostic system that I used for 10 years and loved. That thing was my best friend for 10 years. Well, I put this thing up on the this uh, this laptop up here. And you plug it into something like a Windstar. They had a, you know, it comes in with a check engine light. They don't really have any complaint about the way it runs. Check engine light. You plug it in, and it's worldwide diagnostic system. And I wired the thing up. I put hooked it up to the network and did all this junk. So it was talking to Ford Star and the satellite up there. And I said, I so saw plug it in. I said, and it said, uh, you um, um, have got to reflash this before you can go any farther. Really? Uh huh. I ain't doing that. Because that will wipe out my trouble code and I won't even know what I was looking for. That's a sort of a raw deal, isn't it? I don't plug that thing so fast it'd make your head spin. And plug my other machine that would not, the little NGS, it wouldn't make you reflash it. I'd plug it in and find out what the code was first. And then I'd go reflash it, see? So that, that stuff is, you know, they try to they try to take stuff out of your hands there. And I don't really appreciate that. Uh, whenever uh, anything, these machines are getting too smart, you know. Hey, old Terminator coming after us or nothing like that. All right, so uh, let me see. Uh, PO302 is what? Generic, yeah, generic diagnostic trouble code because it starts with a zero, P0302. If it was a P1 something, it would be a manufacturer specific code. Now, if you're using an OBD tool and, and uh, uh, Lundy works at O'Reilly's, I bet you've probably plugged it in and you've seen codes that had a, like a P1 something and it, your scan tool would say, we don't know what this means. Mm -hmm. right? Now, I tell you, I got smacked around, some of you guys know, Moody knows, on uh, 
uh, Katie's um, little Mercury Mariner. Uh, plug it in, PO uh, 128. So what's a PO 128? PO 128 says, running too cold, thermostat stuck open. So I got a thermostat and a gasket for $12.26. Lundy, I mean, not Lundy, but Moody, he, you know, throws it in there with practice deficiency. Never done one before, but did a great job. Puts it in there. We get that thing. We put new antifreeze and water in there. We fire it up. And the engine coolant temperature gauge never gets off the cold mark. And the scan tool says it's running 147 degrees. Well, what is Sam Hill's that all about? When you got one that's running too cold, it's always the thermostat. Ain't it? Well, in that particular case, I shot the radiator hose with my doggone temperature gun, and I saw 205 degrees. And it's right there by the thermostat. And I said, I'll be doggone. So I go to Identifix, and I pulled it up, and they said, yeah, you know, there's one or two that were fixed by putting an engine coolant sensor in there. And so I said, well, I just really don't like this. You know, it's $44 for an engine coolant sensor. I got one coming today. But I put, uh, what did we do? Uh, uh, I don't keep wanting to call you Lundy because your name ends with a Y. Like this. Moody, we hooked up this little potentiometer I got. All right, we, we hooked it up between ground and a signal wire on the engine coolant sensor, and we washed our scan tool, and we dialed it up to where the, what it said on the scan tool matched what the temperature gun read, right? And then we gently unhooked our potentiometer, and we measured the resistance of that, and it was, what, 23,000 ohms? Okay, so I got two resistors that were 10,000 ohms apiece, and I wired them in series, and I made a little jumper, and I jumpered out that little, you know, put them in, it was a booger bear to do it, but I put them in both sides of the engine coolant sensor, and now all of a sudden, I've added some resistance, I mean, I've actually shorted away some voltage so that it's reading hotter, and so it's reading really close to accurate right now because I actually tricked it out. <laughs> well, see, now she don't have a check engine light coming on, but I told her, I said, you're going to have an engine coolant sensor, you know. Uh, she was expecting to get out for $10, $12 or whatever, and, you know, now it's 44 bucks. I don't know if she's going to be happy about that, but anyway. Uh, but that's one of the things that can throw you. You may think that you know PO128, the definition of the, of, the, of the code in the scan tool, absolutely said thermostat stuck open. So what are you supposed to think, you know? Furthermore, if that wasn't enough, she had a picture of her boyfriend covering up the temperature gauge. You know what I mean? Or her brother, actually. Her brother's in the Marines. But she actually had a picture of she had a picture of him, and then behind him was a picture of her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Which, if I was her boyfriend, I'd say, "Hey, why is your brother in front of me?" You know, that's kind of thing. But I, that's another here and there. Okay, now then, uh, the MIL is turned off when that's going to be D, all of the above. The codes are clear with the scan tool. The vehicle is driven on three consecutive trips with a warm-up cycle that meets all the code set conditions without the PCM detecting any faults. See, it's always watching. Uh, power to the PCM is disconnected. Now, on some of these tools, like on the Chrysler DRB3 scan tool that we used to use, it would have what they called a similar conditions window. And what that would mean is we're driving at this speed, at this temperature, doing this with this kind of load, and that's when the code was set. So you can go out there and you can match that similar conditions window and see if you can get that code to reappear. But one way or another, if the PCM sees a similar conditions window come and go three times, it's going to say that probably must have been a fluke. That happens sometimes, product variability in a field, whatever, turns off the light. Okay. Okay, uh, which generic diagnostic trouble code could indicate a loose gas cap or defective emission control system? A, P1603. That's not generic, is it? So we know that ain't right. 442. Yeah, 442. Usually that'll be uh, 455, but 442. Okay, now what was I telling? Who was I talking to the other day? Uh, the, um, uh, look at, see the different codes, the different uh, numbers for that second digit? You basically, the, uh, the seven is the transmission, the six is what? What's the six? I forgot. Out. Yeah, there you go. So if you get a PO603, that means your memory, your, your, your PCM's lost its memory, right? In other words, somebody's disconnected. Sometimes when you disconnect the battery or unplug the PCM and plug it back in and pull a code, you'll get a PO603 code. Doesn't mean your engine controller is bad. It just means, hey, I lost my marbles for a little bit. Don't know where they went. That's what that basically means. And it, and it you know, burns that back in. Next time, you're going to go, PO, what's a 500 series code? What did I tell you, Lundy? It's got to do with idle speed or engine speed. It's either engine speed or vehicle speed. If you've got a PO500, your vehicle speed sensor ain't working. You can have a, you know, like a P1501 or PO501. That's got to do with idle speed control and all that kind of thing. And all that stuff. Sometimes you pull up. But anyway, if you can, if you can parse that, that second digit is going to tell you where you're looking at. Four has got to do with air. Two has got to do with ignition. You know, three has got to do with, uh, it's a misfire thing because of other things. The PCM powertrain control module will automatically clear a DTC if there are no additional detected, uh, detected faults. How long? 40 consecutive warm-up cycles. 40 consecutive warm-up cycles. 
Number 10, a pending code is set when a fault is detected on what? The first fault of a two-trip failure. The first fault of a two-trip failure. Lundy has been reading his book. Had you, Lundy? Lundy been reading? Yes. Yeah, he reads. He reads the book. I told him he needs to read the book, and he reads the book. He follows orders very well. Ain't that right? All right. Technician A says when the MIL is on, the technician retrieves the DTC and follows the manufacturer's recommended procedure to find the root cause of the problem. Technician B says all OBD2 monitors uh, that must have enable criteria achieved before a test is performed. What in the world are they talking about there? Are we confused by that? Both of those guys are right, but if you look at your, uh, like for instance, my catalyst, uh, my engine controller is not going to check my catalyst until it hits a certain threshold of it's got to be at road speed, cruising for this long, stop for this long. It's got to meet these little timers that have got to be set. And when it finally gets through with all of those and it's determined that the catalyst is indeed, see there's, there's some things it can't check until certain conditions have been met while you're driving it. And they've actually got, believe it or not, a little thing that you can plug in that you can buy that you can plug into your data link and just drive it around Go through town, pull over here, stop over there, go and stop at this light, go up down there. And when all of those monitors have cleared, that little thing will go beep and it'll let you know. This is for the mechanic. He drives it around when he knows all the monitors have cleared, it beeps and he's done. Now if he's driving around and won't clear the monitors, you know, he got issues. You gotta go in there and find out, you know, what else is still wrong. If it's tried to clear a monitor and there was a problem there, then you're supposed to go back and fix that. The check engine light comes back on, you got some problems. There's this one guy over there that uh, I know in Ozark that runs a really nice used car lot, and he actually had a before he hired, got his own service department going, he was taking his vehicles to you know to another shop to get them done. He had a check engine light that was on a truck that he had to sell. Okay, so he went over there and they did some work to it and he brought it back, and he drive he drove it himself for a couple of days, make sure it's okay. Pop check engine light comes back on. He goes over there and they did some more work on it. And check engine light pops on again. So he goes over and has to do some more work. <laughs> I mean, you know, he didn't even ask him what they were doing, but every time he went over, they wanted to charge him another couple of hundred dollars. You know, and he says, basically, I charge you, you didn't know, charge me four or five hundred dollars, and every time I go back and check engine light, I back on, what's, what's the deal with this? You know, somebody's not fixing something right. You got to make doggone sure that light don't come back on. You see, it does come back, and you need to transparent, be transparent with your customer. Just tell them, this is what's going on. You know, I fixed this, this is my logic, and now this has happened. You know, so and a reasonable customer will usually be really good about that. Or but if, huh? Or yeah, well, that that truck that they're putting the engine in that was misfiring on cylinder number five, the check engine light's out on that one. <laughs> I mean, when I turned on the key, I didn't see a check engine light anywhere, and I said, no wonder it ain't flashing because it's probably flashing so much it's burning a little bulb out. <laughs> you know? But um, anyway, um, let me see uh, malfunction indicator light. Let's see. Uh, is turned off under any of the following conditions except uh, A, the vehicle driven on three consecutive trips, codes are cleared with a scan tool, PCM diagnostic link is grounded, power of the PCM is disconnected, uh, that is C. That is C. So um, one of the things you also need to recognize too is, uh, and listen to this very carefully, just because you don't have a check engine light doesn't mean you don't have a trouble code. You can have a trouble code with no check engine light. Now over at this parts store, Lundy probably don't see a lot of those because people don't usually say, hey, can you check my car for codes when there's no check engine light? Or they might, but I didn't, you know, usually the check engine light is what tell them to go check for codes. I keep a little uh, scan tool in my glove box that's, you know, about as big as the palm of your hand that I can just plug in and clear a code if I want to. I had a guy tell me you couldn't get a code if the check engine light wasn't on. You can. Sometimes it's not every code. As a matter of fact, if you look at the table, some of them will tell you that this code won't turn on the check engine light. Some of them turn it on, some of them don't. The only time the check engine light is required to come on is if it's emission related. And so if the manufacturer doesn't want people crabbing about check engine lights, if they can get away with not having that thing come on, they're going to make, yeah, it'll store a code, but it ain't going to turn that light on because we don't hear the customer going, rah, 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 you know. Somebody told me back when GM came out with, Ford didn't put check engine lights on there until 88. Chrysler didn't have a check engine light, but they had a light that said power loss. Which was a peculiar light. Um, some of them, like the uh, the Jeep old Jeep Cherokees, had a maintenance reminder light that was hooked to a timer. A little thing with, with a little clear box with gears and circuits in it up under there. It would just go through a time cycle and turn it on. Some of them turn on the lights based on how many miles you'd gone or something like that. Some of them had an inferred mileage sensor, but close the circuit of the engine controller and change the way the thing handles stuff because of the vehicle aging. The EGR would work different. The upstream air would work different. All that kind of stuff. 
And uh, anyway, that's another story. But uh, how deep do you want to go into this, guys? You know, <laughs> you know it, it goes pretty deep. But you can have a trouble code with no, with no check engine light. You know. Uh, now, if somebody's pulled a, it's what's really annoying is if somebody's got a problem and they pull the dog on battery cable because they get tired of looking at the light, and then once you find out what's wrong, there's no code there. What are you gonna do? You know, it's, that's irritating. You know, that's like a guy telling me his uh, silly uh, airbag light was flashing three or four, five or six times. You know, I, what can I do with that? You know, count the things and tell me how many times it's flashing three or four or five or six. I can't do nothing with. Uh, that guy actually do me that way. Um, let me see here. Let's see. How many terminals are in an OBD2 data link connector? Wait a minute. Back up. I got to go to 13. Technician A says OBD2 includes generic as well as vehicle manufacturer specific diagnostic trouble codes and data displays. Technician B says OBD2 vehicles use a 12-pin DLC. No, uh, that's going to be eight. Um, here's another thing. Um, let's say, and I've seen this. It was weird to me because I never saw it when I was at the dealership, but I saw it at the school. The guy comes in here. He's got a Ford Escort, and it's misfiring. Bup, 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 bup. And so we plugged in. We found the problem that there was an injector that wasn't, well, connector wasn't seated good. So I clicked it in, boo, it's running smooth. I go in there, I turn off the, uh, I go into the scan tool in the enhanced room, and I turned off the check engine light. I called myself, then I cleared the codes anyway. But when I backed out of there, the check engine light was still on. I had to go into the OBD2 room, which is a different room in the engine controller. It's two different rooms. You know what I mean? OBD2 and enhanced data are different rooms. And from next you understand that. 80% of the mechanics don't know that. But there are two rooms in an engine controller. We clear it out of the enhanced room, it's still there. We go into the generic room, we clear it there, and then the light went out. It was stored in both rooms, but we don't, when we cleared the enhanced ones, we didn't clear the generic ones that were still in there. That's real important that you soak that up. Now, you may not see that for a long time, but whenever it ever pops up, you'll know it was coming, you see. Cause, I mean, I saw it. I didn't ever see it at a dealership for years. Um, now you see here, um, no, 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 no. let me see, uh, where are we at here? 14. Uh, how many terminals are in there? 16. We're in the data link connector. Okay, an element of the OBD2 diagnostic management system and storage engine data during a DTC set is called what? That's a freeze frame thing. Basically, it's going to have about 10 parameters that it's going to freeze. They were going this fast. It was this kind of temperature. You know, the throttle angle was here. The fuel trims were here. It's going to give you all of that information so that you, that's your similar conditions window. This is where it was when the code was set. You need to record that stuff. If you're pulling a diagnostic trouble code out of one you're checking on, pull the codes, write them down, or save them in your scan tool if it's got that function, and then clear the codes and drive it again to see which ones come back. Got me? Now in your scan tools now with these new uh, newer systems, you'll have pending trouble codes. This is a trouble code I haven't turned on the light for yet, but I'm going to if I see this again. You got me? You go on one trip, you'll have a pending code the next time you turn it on. Sometimes you'll shut your car off at night and you won't have a code. You crank it up the next morning you do. And that's really irritating because I didn't have a check engine light on yesterday. How many of you ever switched your car off uh, and your gas tank was at half a tank and when you cranked it up the next day it was down between a half and a quarter? Don't you love that? Man, it's just it's wonderful. It just makes you want to slap somebody's jaw, you know? Huh? Oof. You know, listen to him. He's not paying attention, is he? I am, All right. but I mean... Huh? Yeah. I don't get how you your tank does that. Uh, it does it. They flat do it. You know, I mean, people gripe about it. When well, we were in high school, well, these old cars, people say, man, I thought I had a half a tank. Now I said I'm down almost a quarter. <laughs> you know, it's just irritating. But um, it's not anything wrong with it. It's just one of the idiosyncrasies of owning a car and having to buy gas. You know, it's just part of the deal. You know? Uh, all right, so let me go here for run out of time. Uh, we're almost done here. Let's get let's get done. We, we've we've done this for 30 minutes and it's kind of fun. Um, this way, no, nobody turns into a skeleton. Okay, now let me see. Ooh, let's see. Onboard diagnostic system levels one and two are being discussed. Right? Technician A says only OBD2 systems require misfire detection. Technician B says OBD1 was capable of detecting exhaust emissions. Who's right about that? That's A actually. In an OBD2 system, when all enabling criteria are met for a given diagnostic, it's considered to be which of the following? A trip. Yeah, that's a trip, basically. That's a trip. Man, that thing, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be tripping. All right. Technician A says warm-up cycles are used to erase DTCs and freeze frame data. Right? Technician B says OBD2 requires diagnostic system to monitor all emission-related components and systems. Who's correct about that? That's C. Both of them are right. And finally, which organizations develop guidelines for OBD2? 
Okay, CARB. Was that was it? What, really? Okay, that's the, that's the EPA actually. CARB is California Air Resources Board. Okay, we got one more question. Y'all got a 20? Or you got a 19? You just got 19 questions? Last one. Which of these two is a. Number 20, which of these is a two trip monitor on an OBD2 vehicle? Diagnostic test on a component that requires a failure to occur on two different driving cycles before a code is set. Diagnostic test on a component that requires two failures within a 24 hour period to set a trouble code. Uh, we had two consecutive failures. What is the C actually? Diagnostic test on a component that requires two consecutive failures to set a trouble code. Now it will sometimes give you a pending code so that you'll know that there's one coming down the pike. Got that? All right. All right.